Good morning, my friends. Thursday morning. Are you ready for some minor profits? That's the topic for today. It's a whole lot better than what you think. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for the minor profits. They're not minor in any way, shape, or form. But I didn't choose that name. <laughs> Lord, we love you. We're thankful that we can study your Bible. Teach us the things we need to know about these 12 good men of God, which in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll have to put that to rest, I guess. Um, the, 12, the 12 minor prophets, why are they called minor? Well, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are only minor in that they're not very long. You can't compare Isaiah 66 chapters to Obadiah, one chapter. It wouldn't be fair. So I guess in that sense, uh, the word minor is correct. I don't like to use the word minor prophets because it belittles them a little bit. And it's not true. They're, uh, they're just as, as important men of God as uh, the major prophets. <clears throat> that being said, let, let's go to, to the first one, Hosea. Now, we're doing just a thumbnail, just a sketch, just scratching the surface. But uh, Hosea is a great book in the Bible. Uh, Hosea was definitely told by God to marry an unfaithful wife, Gomer. And um, the children that they would have would also be unfaithful. Now, why would God do this unless he had a really, really good reason? Well, he was going to compare Hosea's wife, Gomer, to Israel. Israel had an adulterous affair, if you will, with the world. They would worship God, then they would go off with false gods. Just like a wayward woman or a wayward man would go off with a... You got the idea. Gomer typified the lack of trust in Almighty God that God wanted people to see. You see, an unfaithful wife in this case, an unfaithful wife um, hurts everybody. Themselves, the children, the husband, the close relatives and family, and the image they portray to everybody. Israel... Israel was adulterous. They were hurting themselves and everybody around them. And they were hurting God. Because God chose Israel and loves Israel. And he'll always love Israel. He's given them a lot of chances and he's going to give them more. When I was growing up, I've told you this many times. I got in trouble, um, little things. I didn't go to jail. No, I don't mean that kind of trouble. But I was mischievous and, and got, uh, got spanked a lot. I got to see my father in a different light. My father, the athlete, was so much fun. He could pour in foul shots underhanded better than I could overhand. I was 17 years old. My dad was still beating me. If I made 8 out of 10, he made 9 out of 10. If I made all 10, he would make all 10 and then beat me in a playoff. <laughs> he was really good. He was really good. So I saw him in that light, wonderful guy. But when he took the belt off and I saw my father as the administrator of pain which was, that's what it was, 
um, I saw him in a different light. Since those times, I have grown to respect what my father did. My father said, you can't get away with it, Alan. You have to be punished. God told Israel, you can't get away with it, Israel. You are going to be punished. Okay. Hosea is a great book. You want to read it. It's not all that long. You, you can read any of these books in, in uh, um, I don't know, half hour, an hour. I don't know how bad a re re fast a reader you are, but um, you, 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 can, you can get it done. One of my favorite people, Joel. Joel has recorded uh, in his prophecies um, things that are Short and sweet and can't be beat. That's the saying I use sometimes. They're short and right to the point. I mean, he makes his point pretty quick. He describes God's coming judgment like an invasion of locusts. <laughs> an invasion of locusts. Remember in the Old Testament now, in, in, in the times of Moses, when Moses had to put all those plagues on the Pharaoh? Wasn't one of those plagues locusts? Yes, it certainly was. And the locusts just swarm. They swarm and eat everything and destruct everything. Could they kill a human being? Well, no, not going to kill a human being, but they could be nasty and pestilent and, and uh, cause you a lot of trouble. But what they could do to property, what they can do to the land was very destructive. So that's the illustration that Joel used. Locus, he described as a, a very clear and very terrifying sight. Now, Joel's best known for his prophecies on the coming of the Holy Spirit which would occur hundreds and hundreds of years after, after Joel at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Now, what is the coming of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> You've read chapter 2, and we've talked about this. When a person today accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live with them and help them. To whatever degree the person will allow the Holy Spirit to help him. He doesn't thrust himself upon, uh, upon you, um, but he, would help, he will help you whenever you need help. Remember when the 120, however many there was on the day of Pentecost, they were in a big room celebrating, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, like cloven tongues of fire, people will say, well, the prophets were on fire. No, not in the sense that they were saying it. They weren't burning up. No, they weren't hurt. No, the Holy Spirit looked like cloven tongues of fire, but they were being blessed by God. And you will be blessed by God when you receive the Holy Spirit. That comes with, it comes with Jesus. It comes with salvation. And of course, that's why we're doing this. <laughs> The next Old Testament prophet is Amos. Uh, Amos was a shepherd. And um, he was called to give a message nobody wanted to hear. Israel had grown complacent. They were lazy. Spiritually, they were non-existent. They were hypocrites, if you will. And they committed all types of injustice. They, they were um, in a form of slavery, greed, and mistreatment, especially of the poor. Every day, Joe Dolchus and Sally Jones got treated really poorly. And Amos's criticism still hit the mark today. So Amos exposed 
a hypocritical behavior in Israel. You know, in a way, all of the minor prophets, the so-called minor prophets, they exposed weaknesses that Israel had. And Israel had a lot of weaknesses. They still do today. Okay, I'm getting into a little bit more than I wanted to. Let's go to Obadiah. One chapter, shortest chapter in the Old Testament. Obadiah talks about the judgment that is awaiting the nation of Edom. You know where Edom was started from. And you know the story of Esau and Jacob. Well, this is Esau's land, Esau's area. And we know that Esau did not worship God like Jacob did. Jacob was a rascal in the beginning, but he got, got with it with God. Yes, he did. And um, when you look at Obadiah and, and he talks about the judgment that uh, Edom's going to go through, um, this had, this had uh, done nothing to help Judah um, when they needed help. No. Edom's actions um, would be revisited uh, upon them. In other words, their land and their wealth would be lost just as Judah's had been lost. A taste of your own medicine. It's a short book but it's like Philemon in a way. It has a great story to tell, and it doesn't waste any time getting into it. Short book. This is one you can read in 10 minutes or less, but it'll stay with you for a while. That takes us to the best known of the minor prophets, perhaps. Jonah. Jonah and the great fish. Jonah was a reluctant prophet. We cannot deny that, nor would we want to. God told him to go to Nineveh, that great city of Assyria, and preach God to them. And he ran the other way, got on a ship, tried to hide from God. Well, you can't hide from God. And God can find elaborate ways to get your attention, and that leads to Jonah being in the belly of a great fish. We don't know what kind of fish it is. It's not important. But he was in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights. Jesus alluded to it, and some other people in the New Testament alluded to it. Now, here's the point. This doesn't get emphasized too much. Jonah had really good reasons why he didn't want to go. He did not like the people of Assyria. They were nasty, vicious warriors. And they had done a lot of damage in Jonah's own family. And he didn't want to go there and, and preach the Old Testament gospel to them and have them get saved. He didn't want them to get saved. He wanted them to be punished. Well, Jonah needed to wake up to the fact that that's not his department, God's department. Yeah, God does the punishing. God was showing through the book of Jonah that the people of Nineveh were just as important as the Jewish nation and the other people. God loves everybody. You see, it's very hard to imagine loving somebody as contemptible as the Assyrians were. But God's making that point. If you miss that point, then you miss the point of the whole book. Well, you know what the story is. He gets on the ship. The ship, uh, um, is, there's turmoil. They throw him overboard. He gets, he gets uh, swallowed by a large fish. He realizes he is in serious trouble. He prays to God. God has the fish spit him up on the shores of Nineveh. <laughs> God is good and God is great. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. See, God never makes any mistakes. And isn't it, um, isn't it amazing? God has a connection with great fish, birds, 
lions and tigers, bears and giraffes. Yeah, they know him, and he knows them. And they respond to him. And if he commands them to do something, they don't ask why. They do it. Yeah. What can we say about thousands, maybe more than that, maybe hundreds of thousands of people getting right with God? We can only say praise the Lord. These nasty people from the king all the way down to the lowest person in Nineveh, they heard the, they heard the Old Testament idea of the gospel, <laughs> faith in God, the coming Messiah, and they got right. Now they were going to lose their. They were going to. They were going to go back to their old ways. But those people. At the time of Jonah, when he did preach to them, got right with God. And that's always good. And uh, that's what everybody. That's what everybody should want. Okay, let's move on. J Jonah's a great book. Uh, it's not very long. All these books are worth reading, and I know a lot of you haven't read them. Um, let's go to Micah. Micah's well known for lots of things, but M Micah, uh, he had a familiar message to Israel and Judah. Um, they had turned away from God. They were following idols, false God, false prophets, and disaster was coming their way if they didn't repent. That was Micah's message. Micah tried to remind the people that what God truly desired from men and women of any age wasn't religious nonsense. It wasn't ceremonial type things. What God is interested in is faith. The people of Israel being faithful to him. What God wanted wasn't particularly difficult to understand. He wasn't outrageous. He wasn't asking for more than they could do. Micah kind of told it like it is. He was also prophetic, and uh, we'll go we'll go into that um, another time. Um, let's go to Nahum. <laughs> I always feel sorry for Nahum and Habakkuk. Not too many people ever go there. Uh, don't know too much about them. Uh, and Nahum maybe is the most unknown prophet in the Old Testament, but. His main purpose in his book, short book, uh, Nation Foretold, The Ruin of the Assyrian Empire, what we were just talking about with Jonah. Um, they had taken Judah into slavery and exile. His words warn that no nation was so powerful to be beyond the reach of God. God's judgment was coming on Assyria. He was going to be swift and was going to be hard. And for the ones alive at that time, permanent. The book of Nahum may be short, but it has a very powerful message. Habakkuk, very similar. Um, Similar in that he has a message, but his message was, it was different in this sense. Habakkuk emphasizes um, that many of, uh, of, of exactly the opposite of what the other prophets were saying. Instead of teaching about judgment, which is what Jonah and Micah and some of the others, uh, um, um, Nahum and, and so forth, were teaching. He asked a lot of questions. He asked questions like you do. Why does God let 
bad things happen to good people? That's a common question asked today. Um, why does God allow so much evil in the cities, these gangs that are killing people um, for initiation into a gang? Um, if God is so almighty powerful, um, why do wicked people get ahead? He asked some tough questions. Um, he brought these questions to God in prayer. And he did get consolation in God's strength and his power. Habakkuk shows us that those people in ancient times, long ago um, um, times, those believers, they wrestled with the same kind of difficult problems then, sin, evil, suffering, as Christians do today. Not a brand new topic. No, Habakkuk was, he was different in that regard. Okay, let's go to Zephaniah. Um, Zephaniah prophesied. He predicted the future. Um, he lived during the time of Josiah. Um, Zephaniah warned Judah that if they did not turn from their wicked ways... All this idol worship stuff, God's judgment would fall on them, and hard. But God's day of judgment um, is portrayed not just as a day of suffering, but as a time of rejoicing when God could return to rescue the opposed and to restore all the things that had been ruined. The wicked had cause to fear judgment, and the faithful had cause to look forward to it, to see the promise of, of the coming. A lot of prophecy in Zephaniah. Then we have Haggai. Haggai's namesake preached a sermon at Winona Lake. There was a man named Pastor Haggai. Winona Lake was famous for having good preachers. They had a big lake there, and they had a, 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 a hill where you could sit down and listen to the preachers. It was acoustically uh, perfect. Um, it was a real nice place. And a man named Hagee, Haggai, he preached a great sermon when I was young in the faith, and I was mesmerized. I remember him saying, if you could take a door and blow that door up big enough, you could walk through it. And I thought about that. He was saying that the door was porous, but you would have to get it big, blow it way up in order to walk through it. But yes, it could be done. He was talking about Jesus walking into the upper room. <laughs> In his resurrected body, he didn't come through the door. It had no impact. Molecular structures had no impact on Jesus' resurrected body. Uh, I'm, I'm going off a little bit here. Uh, Hagee, uh, I keep saying Hagee, I'm sorry. Haggai served as a prophet um, to the Jews um, wasn't a big group that he, he, he prophesied to. Um, they were returning from exile, um, trying to rebuild Jerusalem, trying to rebuild the temple. And his message was one of encouragement, hope. God's still here. He can still help us. Even though they had fallen far from the days of uh, um, in the past where they had been when Solomon was the Renaissance man of uh, the Old Testament. Yeah, it wasn't like that when Haggai was preaching. But he did his best with, with a smaller group. It's kind of like, I don't want to compare myself to anybody, but uh, when I first started, I'll tell you this. When I first started, there was a friend of mine in Missouri, and we would have been happy, really happy, 
if we could get 100 people a month to come and, and read my material. Didn't have videos then. Now, this past week, there's been 500 plus people uh, in the last two days that all over the world that have listened to these videos. I'm humbled by it. Believe me, they're not coming to see me. They're coming to hear the word of God. Somehow that word of God is touching people that I will never know in this lifetime. But I might meet a whole lot of them <laughs> in heaven. Okay, let's go to Zechariah. Zechariah was uh, um, a prophet, kind of like Haggai. Um, he directed his message to the surviving remnant. Um, returning from Babylon, Zechariah stands out. Minor prophets, oh, he stands out with the Old Testament uh, um, minor prophets. He was a man of God who spoke clearly about the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus, the anointed one. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, Zachariah, he was on the ball, no question. Okay, that leads us uh, in our thumbnail sketch. That leads us to the last, to the last uh, preacher, uh, Malachi. After Malachi, it was going to be four hundred years. No prophesying, no prophecy, no predictions. I'm going to talk about that too, but not today. Malachi is, is preaching um, to the returning exiles, and uh, Malachi offers a, uh, well, I guess you would say well, it wasn't as happy a message as some of them um, were bringing. Um, they had uh, they'd been through um, a lot, disobedience. Um, priests and leaders were leading their flock astray, um, there was only a few faithful remained um, who lived in the glory of God and obeyed God's laws and his word. The book of Malachi um, was a strong wake up. You don't realize it, but it's going to be quiet from God for a long time. The emphasis, I guess you would say, with that Malachi is that uh, he reminded them of the necessity of believing in the coming Christ, the anointed one, the Lord and Savior that was coming. Old Testament minor prophets, scum, uh, just a, a thumbnail sketch. Yeah, well, it's fun to do it. And um, we're going to go back and have a review, and the review is going to cover people um, in a shorter way yet. Review is a wonderful thing. If I were to ask you, what do you remember about Adam? Well, you'd say, well, he was the first man. Okay. How did God bring him into this world? Oh, well, he reached down and picked the dust from the ground. And what did he do then? Well, he reached down and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. What happened? Adam became a living soul. That's what happened. You see, if you review, things will pop into your mind quicker. Who was Eve? First woman. Mother of all living. Came through Adam's rib. God instituted marriage between a male and a female. Not what's going on in the United States of America and around the world today. No. If I had told you 25 years ago, men would be lusting after men and women would be lusting after women, um, you would say, well, we got to do something about that. Well, see, the thing is, we are not doing something about that. 
We're protecting them with laws, saying it's okay. If they knocked on my door and asked me to uh, um, do a marriage and I didn't do it, I could lose my license. Yeah, that is a true statement. But I got news. We'll let that go. This has been a fun time. This has been a good time to know and understand the Bible. We've gone through the Old Testament now, thumbnail sketch, overview, just scratching the surface, and now we're going to get going to go back and we're going to review. And each time we do that and review, we get a little deeper into the Word of God. It's a fun time. Uh, you either like it or you don't like it, and, and I love to do it, so I, I'm hooked totally on the Word of God. Yeah. Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Father God, for this time together. It's been wonderful, Lord. Uh, thank you for Hosea and Joel and Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. Thank you for Nahum and Habakkuk. Thank you for Zephaniah, Haggai, and thank you for Zechariah and Malachi. Those 12 men did their best to serve you, Lord. And I think they did a real good job. Thank you, Lord, for them. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You all have a good day today. I'm going to have one. Bye-bye.